we spoke about the chaos, we spoke about profit. We haven't spoken yet about Nicki Minaj. So um, oh. along comes uh, Nicki Minaj with this tweet about her cousin in Trinidad and his friend who has these swollen testicles and he blames it on the vaccine he took. And it creates a firestorm. She has 22 million followers online. The CDC puts out a, another tweet in response saying you should get vaccinated against COVID-19 if you're trying to get pregnant now or in the future. No evidence to the data shows that any vaccines, including COVID-19 vaccines, to date shows that any vaccine, including COVID-19 vaccines, can cause fertility problems in men or women. This has created a firestorm. It's created a big debate online. Surely some of her 22 million followers are going to believe her. She probably didn't do it for any negative reasons. She probably just did it out of genuine concern. But it tells you how dangerous it is to have an environment where there's so much disinformation that someone can even can put out a tweet, maybe innocently, maybe not innocently, but can create a firestorm based on the volume and the environment and the whole disinformation stratosphere that we've built ourselves. It's really dangerous. Nick? I would recommend that people take information from their local physician and not Nicki Minaj. <laughs> Nicki Minaj is an excellent artist and she should be praised for her talent, but Nicki Minaj does not have a medical degree. And I'm not saying this in a way that I am trying to say that I'm better than her or I'm more important for any reason, but it's because I know the facts. There is no association between the vaccine and impotency. There's no association between vaccines and infertility. There's just a number of conspiracy theories that get spread that are incredibly dangerous and are leading to death. And you know, another one of the problems you just brought up, Zev, is that our healthcare infrastructure can only handle so much. There are stories of people who haven't been able to get beds and have died due to delays in care. This was something that I read. It was a Slate article that a physician wrote about where somebody was supposed to have their gallbladder removed and didn't and died while they were waiting for care. So this has a disproportionate effect on everybody who seeks care in our healthcare system. And there's only so much capacity to care for so many people at any one given time. And people need to recognize that sooner or later, even if this doesn't affect them in terms of COVID, this may affect them in another way. Yeah. I, I mean, would like to add, so go ahead. Thing, you know, first of all, I, I want to express my appreciation to Nick for coming to New York City last April when I was here and we were in the real depths of despair. This thing hit us like a tsunami. We didn't understand it. We didn't know the science and the death rate was insane. I mean, I, I walked up to my office at Columbia. There was a white morgue truck a block from my office for the overflow bodies from the COVID patients. And it was just such a trauma. Now I was a guinea pig in the Pfizer trials for the vaccine. And I'm full of admiration for the people who developed it because it has the potential to save millions of lives. But I just went to Oklahoma and guess what? In my hometown, the hospital has set up tents the way they had in Central Park for the overflow from the hospital. And Tulsa, Oklahoma had the white refrigerator morgue trucks for the overflow bodies. Now in April of 2020, there was an excuse. We didn't know. In August, September 2021, there is no excuse. The vaccine is there. People are being misinformed, disinformed, and the stress that it puts on the medical system and on the physicians like Nick and the entire society is just unacceptable. Absolutely. I was actually got that first batch of, of COVID-19 when I was in New York that April or whatever it was. It was March for me. And it was the worst disease I've ever had. So I can't imagine why any leader of any political party or any movement would think to themselves that it's a, it's responsible in any way to be promulgating all these myths and lies. It just is beyond belief when you think about all the negative impact it has on people. And of course, you can still suffer long-term symptoms from long COVID. I mean, it's not like it goes away once it's cured. The other thing about getting COVID is it's such a gamble. Four out of 10 people who get coronavirus don't have any symptoms at all, which right. make it a really sinister virus because they can still spread it as well. And then you get people who have mild disease like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea uh, to moderate disease to severe disease where people are getting blood clots and strokes and uh, acute respiratory failure where they're having to be put on ventilators. And everybody who's come in who has, at least for me, everybody who's come in who's had symptomatic COVID has said, I'm going to get vaccinated as soon as I get better, as soon as I'm you know, able to. Mm. And it's really nice and really important to hear, but Anne's right. This is exhausting. 
And we're trying to do something to decrease the amount of disinformation. And a number of us have gotten together to launch No License for Disinformation. And what No License for Disinformation is, is it is a website where we have some of the uh, worst offenders who are out there spreading COVID-19. And people can go and they can look and see who's on there as well as enter uh, physicians in who are spreading COVID-19 disinformation. And then there are links to the state medical boards where they can report them. This That's a great initiative. Of, uh, That's a really smart initiative. So people just go to this website and they can uh, report violations no matter who they are. And, and where does it go? Well, who does that, uh, who do the reported the reports go to? So the background on this is that throughout the coronavirus pandemic, the medical licensing boards and the board certification bodies and all the organization in, in medicine had been silent about disinformation. And then on July 29th, the Federation of State Medical Boards put out a statement that said that physicians who spread misinformation or disinformation may be liable to have their license suspended or revoked. And that was like a a shimmer of light in the darkness for those of us who have been on the front line and have dealt with all of this death and suffering for all these years because it's like finally we have somebody who actually is in a position of power to do something about this yeah. and so what we consequences and i truly believe that there are a number of physicians out there who have demonstrated that they no longer meet the criteria that are required in terms of just b basic ethics to actually hold a medical license. And so we are at uh, NLFD, no license for disinformation underscore dot org. There's a link to the website there. And what happens is, is you can go in, look at the physicians and read about the physicians who are spreading disinformation. And then it will link you to the state medical board where you can launch a complaint. Mm -hmm. You can't actually leave a complaint on the site that registers with the state medical boards because all 50 states have individual state medical licensing boards. And what really needs to happen is the statement has been made, and we are very, very appreciative that this statement has been made by the Federation of State Medical Boards, but the spreaders of disinformation aren't responding to strongly worded statements. There needs to be real and actual consequences. What we need to do is register our concerns and complaints with the medical boards that these physicians are so outside the norms of practicing physicians and are so outside the norms of the medical consensus about vaccines being safe and effective and about ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, and other types of medications not being effective at all, that they should no longer have a medical license. And it's really going to take a popular movement to tell the medical boards, it's time to do something about this. Unless they do something about this, this pandemic is going to continue on and on and on and on. And we really need to shut down this pipeline of disinformation. And so that's a strategy that we're taking. And I'm hoping that people will go to that website and, and file cool complaints as well as call the medical boards. So the uh, domain name is no license for disinformation.org, or you mentioned a shorter version as well. On Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram, and on TikTok even, it's at NLFD underscore org. It's just no license for disinformation.org. This is going to have to be a popular movement. This is really on us to make this happen. Because Absolutely. It's a great idea. It's, 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 Congratulations. That's really fantastic. That it's not happening. Well, thanks for giving us a microphone here. Oh, absolutely. So the you, people putting their information, they, they say who the violators are, you don't keep that information that goes, they would have to go to the boards when, once they refer to it and then report it there. If that's, that's correct. Yeah. There's all the information that they will need there in order to understand who these, it's a very small number of physician, it, you know, the vast majority of physicians out there are working to stop this pandemic and stop coronavirus. Mm. But it's a very small number. So they'll see the information there. They'll see the license number. They can click the link to file a report. And when you go to a file a report, you just fill out the information and what they've done wrong. And there's plenty of public information about what these physicians have done wrong. And it's not hard to do. It's really not yeah, hard that's to great. file complaints. That's a terrific project you've, you're involved in there. Someone was asking online, is there a legislation that could be passed or is there legislation that's applicable in terms of like the AIDS legislation where if you're infecting people or you're um, you know, helping people get infecting other people that you're actually you know, liable in front of the law. Is there a, such legislation out there? Does any, either of you know, Anne or Nick, if there's something like that out there? So I think that's a tremendous idea. I think federal legislation is going to be really challenging given the close division between uh, in the Senate. I don't imagine that would ever pass through the Senate. California, they have been working on a bill about disinformation, but 
it stalled out before the latest legislative session end ended. I just learned about it recently the other day. It's called AB 133. If anybody wants to look it up, it's uh, you go to calledge.gov. But it stalled out right before the legislation ended and uh, interested to learn more about it and see what they do with that because we need a tougher stance. Yeah. That's really, that's interesting. We'll, we'll look into that. And before uh, we let both of you go, I just want to put a button on this whole thing of the CNP being involved in this. You mentioned there's a series of meetings that maybe happened early on. What's been going on since that early on meeting? Like, has this been a continuing thing that the Council of National Policy are involved in? Are they still pursuing this incredibly dangerous and deadly strategy? Well, we've got documentation that they helped set it in motion. And mm-hmm. There was a recording of various phone calls that, that we have access to where they, they state the plan and then they carry out the plan. And then uh, Jenny Beth Martin and Simone Gold and others continue. Simone Gold has presented her case at the secret Council for National Policy meetings. So we've got those agendas. Now, following the money isn't always easy in these cases, but if, if you look at my book, Shadow Network, you can see how the money and the media and the strategists are tightly coordinated. Mm. So the fact that she's been appearing in places like Charlie Kirk, he's another member from Turning Point USA. She's been on his video show. She's been on fundamentalist broadcasters. This could not happen without their ongoing support. Mm. And again, it also plays into their strategy because they've been working with the 30 Republican-controlled state legislatures to pass voter suppression laws and other ways to guarantee that they take Congress next year, regardless of the popular vote, hmm. by Shocking. by disqualifying electors and various laws. So they have partner organizations. One is ALEC. The other is Heritage Action that have been going state by state in coordination with these other activities. And I think the key word with this group is coordination. Right. You spoke about your book, which is an excellent book. Everyone should read it. It's absolutely essential. Shadow Network, Media Money, and the Secret Hub of the Radical Right. This is really what your book is about, is how coordinated this effort is, that it doesn't just exist in one sphere of influence, it exists in every sphere of influence. And it's a fantastic read. So tell people a little bit more about what they can expect from this book. It's now on paperback, I think. It's a paperback with a new chapter about how this played into the high, the COVID disinformation as well as January 6th. And basically, I trace it back 40 years to a group of fundamentalist televangelists and fossil fuel interests that decided that they were losing the popular will in the United States, that Americans were becoming more progressive and more tolerant, and this was not satisfactory to them. So they set out ways to find ways to game the system. And they have never expected to win the popular vote. They have never won it. Uh, They never will. But there are various ways to manipulate the Electoral College and congressional elections that give them a disproportionate amount of power. And they're also trying to advance this through state laws. The latest version of this is the absolutely draconian Texas abortion law. Mm -hmm. So a woman with ectopic pregnancy who will never deliver a viable baby and who will well may well lose her life in the process is barred from having a procedure. A 12 year old who's raped and is four foot 10 is required to bear that baby. It's just horrific what they're doing. And they intend to leverage it across state lines to other Republican controlled legislatures and divide this country in the cruelest way you can imagine. And that really is for power. When we had Dr. Steve Hassan on last week, he also mentioned that I was surprised to hear that the Moonies were a part of the CNP in their in their early days. Is that true? I mean, is the moon are the Moonies a party to the to the CNP? They certainly show up in in the research of the early days of the of the Council for National Policy. And a researcher named David Troy has established various intelligence links. But I think that if you go to anyone in the constellation of the radical right, there'll be some kind of primary or secondary <laughs> contact there someplace. Right. But the CNP itself has been a group of four hundred plus or minus individuals who are working on this agenda quite aggressively. Hmm. I was uh, really surprised and kind of horrified when I saw Donald Trump addressing the Moonies on the, the weekend, it just besides it being September the 11th, just shocking to see an American president in front of a cult, which is, you know, his stated intention is to take over America. Just mind-blowing. All right. Well, thank you both for being on the show. Really appreciate your time. I know, Nick, you've got really important, serious work to get back to. So I appreciate you being here. And tell people again, it's no license for disinformation.org 
or NLFD underscore at various social networks. Is that right? Yeah, it's um, uh, at NLFD underscore org. Well, it's a terrific project you're involved in. And thank you so much for bringing it to narrative tonight. And thank you so much for, for being here as well. Uh, any of you want to share any last thoughts before we move on? You know, the microphone's yours if you'd like to say anything else. Well, I'll just say right. that this is the year for citizen activism because our democracy is at stake. Our public health is at stake. And this should not be a question of whether you've traditionally been a Democrat or a Republican. It's not a matter of that. It's a matter of citizens. It's of our I hope everybody explores ways that they can help. I think that's absolutely true. We have we all have to get involved this year. This is the year to do it. And we're just see, just under you know, over a year left before the next election. Of course, everyone needs to get involved if they can. So Anne's book is called Shadow Network, the Media Money and the Secret Hub of the Radical Right. Please buy it. You'll love it. And thank you both to Anne and Nick for joining us tonight. We'll be right back after this with some news about uh, Jeffrey Epstein and that George Bush painting. Hey, everybody. Thanks for supporting Narrative. If quality and craftsmanship is important to you, and of course it is to you, you should check out today's sponsor, Made In. Made In is a cookware and kitchenware brand that works with renowned chefs and artisans to produce some of the world's best pots, pans, knives, and wine glasses. The best chefs around the world use Made In cookware and kitchenware to create all the best tasting restaurant quality meals. Made In sources the finest materials and partners with renowned craftsmen to make premium kitchen tools available directly to you without the markup. Their pots, pans, knives, and wine glasses produced by Made In are among the best in the world. They are built to last and offer a lifetime warranty. They have 28,000 five-star reviews and their products are used by some of the world's best chefs at Michelin-starred restaurants around the world. Made in better cookware for better meals. Right now, Made in is offering our listeners 15% off your first order with promo code NARRATIVE. That's 15% off your first order with promo code NARRATIVE. It's the best discount available anywhere online for Made in products. So go to madeincookware.com forward slash narrative and use the promo code NARRATIVE, N-A-R-A-T-I-V, for 15% off your first order. That's madeincookware.com forward slash narrative, use promo code narrative. Hi friends, thanks for supporting narrative. This portion of the show is brought to you by Policy Genius. Summer's coming to an end and the leaves are about to fall. And while Mother Nature does her thing preparing for the new season, you can do yours by getting free life insurance quotes with Policy Genius. You could save $1,300 or more per year on life insurance by using Policy Genius simply to compare policies. The licensed experts at Policy Genius work for you, not the insurance companies, so you can trust them to help you navigate every step of the shopping and buying experience. Policy Genius's excellent service has been endorsed by thousands of five-star reviews on Trustpilot and Google, and eligible applicants can get covered in as little as a week thanks to an award-winning policy option that swaps the standard medical exam requirement for a simple phone call. This exclusive policy was recently rated number one by Forbes Advisor, higher than options from Ladder, Ethos, and Bestow. Visit policygenius.com and you'll be able to work out your coverage needs in minutes and find your best price for life insurance. And Policy Genius will take care of the paperwork and scheduling at no cost to you. They never sell the information you give them to other companies or add extra fees. Head to policygenius.com to get started right now. Policy Genius, when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. So I was going to talk a little bit a little more about uh, Ghislaine Maxwell. You know, this last weekend, of course, was 9-11. And we also found out not only that we were marking that day with the 20th anniversary, but we also found out that the FBI finally revealed those documents that have confirmed what many of us have suspected that the Saudis did, in fact, support many of the 9-11 terrorists. And we all sort of knew that, right? I think I knew that. I mean, it certainly seemed yeah. like it's been floating around in the in the ether for a while. And some of these documents have been previously referred to in other investigations. We've known that that's a, a real thing. But what we didn't get, and I think this is a question that people still need to answer, is what did George Bush know and when did he know it? Because it's all very well that the Saudis were involved in this, but George Bush, famously funded by the Saudis and supported by the Saudis, also had that photograph of him surrounded by the Saudi ambassador on the White House patio over there. When did he know that this was a Saudi-supported event? It may not have been on 9-11. Surely soon afterwards, you would have found out something like that. So that's a question that I think we still should be asking. And while we're looking into all of this, we were all reminded in about the painting that Jeffrey Epstein had, which is this really iconic painting 
painted by a, a student at the New York Arts Academy. Many of you will recall the stories around it. There are, in fact, a series of two paintings. The one on the left, as you can see, is Bill Clinton in a dress, very provocatively dressed, and obviously a reference there, many people think, to Monica Lewinsky. The one on the right is George Bush, and he is holding a paper plane, and there are two collapsed stacks of dominoes on the floor that are really evocative of 9-11. He's sitting in front of the Oval Office desk, so it seems to me like a real um, dig at, at him. In fact, they both seem like they're swipes at the former presidents. These are certainly not positive portrayals. So I contacted the author of the Ghislaine Maxwell and Unauthorized Biography, which is Kirby Summers, who's a friend of the show, and many people know about Kirby, and asked her what she thought about this. I mean, is there any indication that what we're seeing here is something that Epstein both owned? Did he own both paintings? Well, there's some uncertainty about whether they were that he owned both, but there's also what were they intended to do? So here's what Kirby had to say. If it had not been for a woman who had an appointment with Jeffrey Epstein at his Upper East Side Manhattan mansion, walked into his home and she was very surprised to see this very, rather large painting of Bill Clinton wearing a blue dress and high heels pointing at the observer and she was so surprised that she took out her camera because everybody has a camera these days mm -hmm. and she snapped a photograph and she sent that photograph i believe to the daily mail she was subsequently interviewed by a couple of other papers but she wants to remain anonymous so but however one of the quotes says it was absolutely Bill Clinton. It was shocking. It was definitely a painting of him. It was a very provocative, sensual pic picture. He was wearing heels, a blue dress, and his hand was in a weird position. And then she basically said that she had an hour-long meeting with Epstein and that he came off as really creepy. And then when she was leaving, there was a young 14-year-old Spanish girl, 14-year-old 14, 14 girl waiting to see him next. Now, what's interesting is that if that person had not taken a photograph and given it to the media, it would be denied. Right. So what's happened is for the painting, you know, exactly like you mentioned, it's called War Games. Mm -hmm. It was painted by the same artist, who Katrina Ryan Clyde, mm -hmm. who went to the New York Academy of Art. She painted both in 2012. They both were exhibited at the same time. I think I sent you a photograph yeah, you of the exhibit. It's interesting that they were both exhibited. If it had so that's interesting, right? So now we both know they're exhibited at the same time. I mean, they're, you know, both, both paintings are really dis disgusting. Um, exhibited by the same time, painted by an Australian student at the New York Academy of Art in 2012, sold for $1,300 a piece. It seems likely to me that why would uh, Epstein have just bought the one painting? He likely would have bought both because the money was not really a factor to him. And these are pretty unique uh, artworks. I'm just almost sure that he would have created them himself or at least have commissioned them himself. It seems bizarre to me that an Australian student would have come up with this much detail about what essentially conspiracies um, so early on. What's your take on this, uh, Heidi? Mm, we just know it's creepy. Yeah. Uh, my take is that it's creepy and Epstein's creepy and the world that we're going to be delving back in with Ghislaine and, you know, what comes from that trial is going to just be massively creepy. But I think when it comes to 9-11, we need what my friend Jeff Stein calls a cleansing. We need to know what happened. We need to know who was involved. We absolutely need to know what our intelligence agencies did or didn't know. And for us to move forward and fully heal as a nation, I think we need to know all the facts. I think you're 100% right there. And I think the reason that we need to know is not just for the healing piece of it and the reconciliation piece of it. But when you look at these two paintings, I mean, my suspicion is that we are talking about something that was potentially used as a blackmail item. These mm. are the equivalent of seeing of handing someone a black and white photos in a, in a dirty manila alvinol. It's they're designed to embarrass presidents of the United States. And I think as we try to understand what Jeffrey Epstein did and why he did what he did, which I think is crucial to national security going forward and as is crucial to, to understanding exactly how Trump got into power, then we need to understand what these paintings really were. It's not just a curiosity. It could be a lot more. It seems to me that he was running a blackmail ring against many really influential people in America. And we don't know to what end and we don't know how successful it was. But as we start seeing even people like Prince Andrew being involved in something right. like this, which is clearly 
somehow involved. There's a civil litigation starting and Ghislaine Maxwell is going to court next month or the month after. I think this is something that we really need to be paying attention to. People are sort of sick and tired of Epstein and I get that. But I also think it's one of those things we've got to look at in order to really understand what has been happening in the last 20, 30 years in America. I think this, is, this goes back that long. Absolutely, people should be paying attention um, as we head into these two court cases. Tomorrow on the show, we have a, another piece of the same investigation because today we looked at the CNP and we looked at how doctors are being influenced and how doctors are putting out disinformation. Tomorrow on the show, we're going to be telling people how other operatives might be involved. Here we are again talking about spies wherever we talk it's about these so things. It's so strange. But, you know, are you know, foreign operatives that, involved? Yes. You broke that big story last week on Charles Bowsman, and we have another character similar that has so many curious ties and we're going to take you to the white coat summit that occurred just a few weeks ago and we're going to show you some of the disinformation points that were spoken there how they infected the anti-vax narrative and then we're going to backtrack and show you where and who these people might be affiliated with and why hmm. so it should be what you learned today should really prep you and prime you for what you're going to learn tomorrow. Can't wait for that. That's tomorrow at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Don't forget, you can always support Narrative by going to patreon.com forward slash narrative and supporting us there. Uh, we also have a merch store at narrativemyshopify.com where you can get all sorts of cool gear and stuff. And there's always new stuff being thrown into that shop and we'll add something later this week. So don't forget to check out our store or our Patreon site. Otherwise, we'll see you here tomorrow at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. I do want to say one last thing. I've got to do the ad that I kind of screwed up. So as I go away, I'm going to tell people about one more piece of uh, of, uh, of information from our sponsors. Is there anything else from you, Heidi? Because we, you've done such a great job tonight and, and last week and, and looking at tomorrow's show, it's really interesting. Any last thoughts from you as we head out of the show tonight? My last thought is that uh, celebrities have the ability to use their platform for good or for bad. And I just would encourage those celebrities who are throwing their weight one way or the other to really think about it because a lot of people will be affected. And I think the fight starts right here. Nick announced what's going on. And I think we just carry the fight right here. Absolutely. Great way to end the show. And especially, uh, it will be interesting to see if Nicki Minaj changes her thinking as the days go on here on that story. So good night, Heidi. And I'll just let our viewers know that... Here's an interesting question. Why are 97% of the chickens served in the United States dipped in chlorine? Yes, dipped in chlorine. Believe it or not, that's not something you'd particularly expect. Well, the answer is simple because big food doesn't have the same quality standards as the family farm. That's why you need moinkbox.com. With Moink, you get the highest quality meat you've ever tasted while supporting real family farms. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and wild-caught Alaskan salmon direct to your door, helping family farms become financially independent outside of big agriculture. Their animals are raised outdoors, their fish swim wild in the ocean, and moink meat is free of antibiotics, hormones, sugar, and all the other junk you find pre-packaged in the meat aisle. I love moink. And I know you will too. Moink meat is so delicious. If you want to get the absolute best quality while supporting the little guy, I recommend you get moink right now. Join the moink movement today. Go to Moinkbox dot com slash narrative right now and listeners to this show get free bacon for a year that's one year of the best bacon you'll ever taste but for a limited time spelt moink m-o-i-n-k box.com that's moo and oink together it makes moink slash narrative that's moinkbox.com slash narrative n-a-r-a-t-i-v you get your free bacon for a year Sounds like a good deal. On that note, thank you very much for joining us on Narrative tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 Eastern for our second part in our investigation as we look into the anti-vaxxers and the myths surrounding them. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night.